times uh, during covid when we're all sitting at home it's it's sort of like a ray of light that we get to watch these amazing sessions when we can't all be together it certainly brightens up my evenings aaj pandemic mein hum digitally the literature festival kar rahe hain aur mujhe lagta hai कि हमारे सामने श्रोता नहीं है हम आपस में बात कर रहे हैं लेकिन उस फील को उस उमंग को महसूस कर सकते हैं कि हजारों लाखों लोग हमसे जुड़े हुए हैं हमको सुन रहे हैं और कहीं ना कहीं कोई सार्थक हस्तक्षेप हो रहा है पीपल हु केम ऑनलाइन टू व्यू एंड लिसन टू आर इनक्रेडिबल स्पीकर्स फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द वर्ल्ड वी वर एबल टू कंटिन्यू इन आर ट्रेडिशन ऑफ इंश्योरिंग द फ्री फ्लो ऑफ नॉलेज एंड इंफॉर्मेशन We have a festival co-directors now with the Gokhale William Dalrymple and all my colleagues at Team Book Arts. Welcome back to this new season of the Jaipur Literature Festival Digital Series 2021. Presenting today, India's power elite, Sanjay Baru and Kota Nilima, in conversation with Maya Mirchandani, policy analyst, academic, and writer Sanjay Baru's latest book, India's Power Elite: Caste, Class, and Cultural Revolution. deconstructs the many hues of power and elitism in post colonial india an intricate look into the changing political landscape of the 21st century baru explores the role of caste class and culture in the unraveling of a new india kodan elema an indian author researcher artist and political commentator specializes in rural distress in conversation with academic and journalist mayami chandani they discuss the traces of india's power elite in the face of a constantly evolving reality sanjay baru is a policy analyst writer and columnist he served as the editor of the economic times the financial express and business standard and the editorial page editor of the times of india and indian express he was the media advisor to former prime minister manmohan singh and the director for geo economics and strategy International Institute of Strategic Studies London he was also previously secretary general of FICI his books include the accidental prime minister the making and unmaking of manmohan singh strategic consequences of india's economic performance and 1991 how pb narsimha rao made history kota nilima is an author political scientist and former journalist she writes on poverty gender electoral reforms and democratic deficit she heads the institute of perception studies in new delhi and her initiative rate the debate is the first and only content rating system of indian media during the second covid wave the institute had campaign for recognition of journalists as frontline warriors and maintains a database of journalists whose deaths have been caused due to covid in india She's also authored seven books ranging from poverty to spirituality. Her recent book Widows of Vidarbha: Making of Shadows is a longitudinal study of farmer suicide households. Maya Mirchandani is an award-winning Indian journalist. She now teaches media studies at Ashoka University and is a senior fellow at the Delhi-based Observer Research Foundation. Mirchandani's teaching and research is focused on identifying misinformation and hate speech. and the principles and practice of conflict journalism in an environment where free speech debate and dissent are increasingly challenged condemned or silenced to remember all our sessions that have been broadcast till now including those from the jaipur literature festival are available and archived on this site at the mughal tent venue and of course also on our facebook page jaipur lit fest and on our youtube channel jpr lit fest please do remember to ask questions by typing it into the comment section below ladies and gentlemen we present india's power elite sanjaya baru kota nilima in conversation with maya mirchandani maya over to you thanks a lot sanjay for that wonderful uh, introduction and uh, making my job so much easier and welcome uh, to you nilima and sanjay baru uh your book is uh, uh the topic of our conversation today the power elite i'm going to quote from it as i kick off the discussion uh where you say the elite in a multilayered multidimensional society like india's would of course not be a homogenous group either in social composition or cultural outlook yet you say the centrality of class is what drives uh the 
the identification of this elite so as we kick off the discussion i think what perhaps you could do for our uh, participants and viewers joining in is to explain what you mean by today's power elite who are they well thank you very much maya thank you sanjay and jaipur uh, literary festival this is the cover of the book uh, let it let me show that first uh you know as i mentioned in 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 my book i was inspired to write this um rereading c right mills an american sociologist who wrote the power elite in the 1950s about the united states and what strikes anyone reading uh mills uh, and then looking at india is the fact that the most important distinction between the social structure uh is that mills was looking at uh, and the social structure in india is that class is not the only differentiator um of 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 power and caste is e- equally important um my point of departure is a very famous formulation by ramanohar lohia uh, a socialist leader who wrote in the late 50s that the three defining features of the indian power elite are upper caste wealth and english language the uh, and then what i try to do in this book is to see how that has changed that political power has moved from upper caste to middle caste across the country uh at in new delhi modi becomes a symbol of that shift being the first backward caste prime minister if we leave out devagoda who had a brief tenure wealth composition of the wealthy has changed and i look at both uh, you know landed wealth as well as business uh, elite and of course the role of the english language as a differentiator has changed and and that brings in the cultural dimension to the nature of the elite so these are the three things i try to kind of look at i take the con- current context as the point of departure where i argue uh, that what try what uh, the bjp under modi's leadership unlike the bjp under vajpayee's leadership has launched what i call a kind of a cultural revolution um, challenging the old elite and trying to de- uh, replace them with a new power elite and that's what i try to capture in the book right uh, nilima let me bring you into the discussion as well right now i mean you know while in my sort of uh, pre uh, this panel conversations uh, with both of you on email in fact i mentioned to sanjay that i i have two um, thoughts on on the hypothesis and one is that uh the elite has not been a static power structure in in fact the argument that uh, the 2014 election was a sort of mark mark shift uh it was a shift because it decided to target what he says the english speaking intellectual elite there was a sort of a cultural takeover of of delhi per se uh that was the driving force so the latians gang uh which was uh, sort of outcast i mean one could argue that this is the new latians gang uh the latians elite of delhi today is the bjp is the wealth uh creators of the bjp is the non english speaking businessman of the bjp yet uh whoever this elite might be their relationship with power versus their relationship with the people who actually come out and vote in the villages in rural india in small towns is extremely disconnected and no matter who hands the elitism shift uh from that dynamic is one that does remain static no i i totally agree maya um first of all congratulations to dr baru for this uh, wonderful book very timely uh, i think uh, there is need to identify and define exactly who are the power elite how did they get to be the power elite and what are they doing and who next is going to be the power elite will they survive will they you know continue to be uh, to come back to your question maya i believe those who are excluded from power those who were never addressed by the power elite remain excluded today there has been no change and the change has been the face of the elite has changed but not the nature of the elite i agree with dr baro when he says that a, a new order of elite has come which represented those who were not uh, represented let's put it this way among the elite space before but what has that done to the people who have elected them because these this particular elite is a, is is very unique the power elite which we see after 2014 
was a rebellion against or so called rebellion against the power structure of the liberal elite before hmm. so that might have been the urban the the english speaking you know the absolute contrary of what we see today but therefore it is very unique because the failure of this elite really uh, hurts those who have elected with a lot of hope of representation from this particular elite now that's where i say those who have been excluded remain excluded because the agenda of this elite the power elite from 2014 till today has not been inclusive that would have maintained a, a a kind of connect which you were talking about to the people who had put them in this place but the only agenda has been the victory has been on the past the victory was of on the memory the idea was of dismantling what is to be built in its place has never been uh, has to be inclusive right so therefore that idea has always been very contested for having a contested idea to man manifest itself the elite has to be more liberal but that that's exactly what the problem is right mm -hmm. they, the the paradox is this elite is not inclusive therefore their agenda cannot be inclusive and without an uh, inclusive agenda you can't rebuild so the first half of their agenda which is to dismantle we have been seeing until now and without the agenda of rebuilding now that's where i think answers your question why there is a disconnect why the uh, ex excluded remain excluded is because of this right okay uh, just to take that point forward i mean you said that the elite typically should be more liberal and i think here uh, sanjay baru is the disconnect again uh, to come back to that between the current elite and what they have sought to dismantle uh, wealth and wealth and power of course go and hand in hand but there is a general perception one that this new elite is also trying to superimpose a kind of homogeneity of culture is there a cultural elite that is also trying to emerge from this rising middle class this rising sort of uh, sort of consolidation of hindu identity uh, consolidation of of different caste groups under one religious uh, uh, umbrella that identifies them um, and to also take nilima's point further which is on the issue of inclusivity and the the notion that in 2014 they came to power on a, a, both a mandate and a promise of bringing a larger section of india into the sort of power structure and the power fold we saw policies on demonetization on direct cash transfers on things like that that were ostensibly meant to cater to this goal but none of it seems to have worked really uh, on the ground well you know i think the important thing about uh, what i'm trying to say is that uh, the power elite in india is not a homogeneous entity uh, and i think that is something which um, you know should be recognized and and that is the argument i'm trying to put forward i argue that there are three layers of the indian elite there is a provincial elite there is a national elite and then there is a globalized elite and i have a whole chapter looking at the globalized indian elite uh now when you look at the provincial and the national i think the fundamental change uh in the recent past has been the arrival of the bhartiya janata party as a dominant political force representing the national elite but below that if you look across the country this is being contested mm. and you have provincial elites uh the caste composition varies across the country i have not gone into any great detail state wise it's not a state wise study i try to look at the country as a whole but you look at the rest of india and i argue that the regional sentiment and in, in a sense my my book came out before the results of the bengal and tamil nadu election but the uh, results prove my argument which is that the regional elite or the regionalism as a sentiment is an extremely powerful sentiment in this country that challenges uh this attempt at creating a national uh, elite based on hindu majority realism so there is a there is a tension in indian politics but the striking thing if you look at it from class and caste terms which is what i try to do 
is that in terms of caste across the country today, you have the empowerment of the middle caste. Uh, Nilima is right that the poor remain poor and the poor are, of course, not part of the elite. But if you look at those who are in power or in business, you see a, a shift of the caste, no longer the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas that dominate the power system across the country, the middle caste who are called OBCs, for example, in uh, state after state after state. And the, the interesting thing about Narendra Modi, unlike Vajpayee and Adwani, is that he has tried to incorporate this class. In fact, I argue that Modi's uh, politics has been one of occupying all ideological spaces. He has tried to occupy the left space. He has tried to occupy the mandal space. He, of course, he occupies the mandir space. So if you look at Indian politics over the last 30 years, you know, you had, the, you had mandal politics, you had mandir politics, and you had left politics. And he has tried to occupy all spaces. And the Congress party uh, remains marginalized. Um, so, you know, it is this complexity I'm trying to bring out. I mean, I don't know how much I've succeeded, but I don't want to simplify the problem by saying that, you know, what is happening in Delhi is what is happening in all of India. Hmm. Surely there is a distinction between the national and the regional. And of course, I, I, I also have a chapter at the end on looking at the, the globalized elite in India, how they're increasingly seceding from this country, migrating. And the latest data from COVID shows the number of Indians leaving India in the mm. last one year. It's incredible. Yeah, in fact, uh, I like your categorization of the NRIs as the non-resident Indian, the non-returning Indian, and there was a third one, which uh, um, you can remind me of, but there were three different categorizations of the NRI. Not that really was Indian. Sorry, not really Indian. That's right. Not, not really non-resident really. Indian, not really Indian, and and non-returning Indian. I thought that was actually quite uh, quite funny as well. Uh, uh, you know, but but to take that point further, and you talk about the globalized. So these three different structures of the elite. What I found the most fascinating about the way you kind of talk about the shift in the the kind of elite that is being created was the cultural shift. Now that cultural shift exists at different levels. It exists as, um, as somebody who's a media studies uh, person, a journalist. I saw a cultural shift change uh, when television started showing religious serials or the quote unquote ubiquitous Sas Bahu serials that was also a consolidation of a particular kind of, of India that, uh, that seems to have kind of spread the Bollywoodization of India that we talked about. The political power elite and the sort of um, cultural imagery of, of that kind of India has coalesced somewhere. Now, I don't know if this is my opinion or this is my perception or this is really a fact. Maybe you can shed some light on that. Nilima, I'll come to you uh, after, after he uh, talks. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very, very interesting observation. You know, um, the, the change that has happened is that those who stayed at home watching the Ramayana program or the Sas Bahu program of the 1980s and the 1990s, they were the outsiders in the power structure of Delhi. They may well have been in power in different parts of the country, but they were certainly not the insiders in, in New Delhi. And I think that is a change. Today, they are the insiders. You know? and, and that is why I make this you know, point that what Raman or Loya said, that English speaking is a defining quality of the elite and today it no longer is, uh, mm. it no longer is. So the, that shift, which we, which you correctly say that, you know, we began to see at the provincial level, at the state level, uh, while in Delhi, it was still very much the Oxbridge, the St. Stephen's Wallas, the Doon School Wallas, you know, um, who are, uh, you know, really the Luthiens Delhi, if you like, that Modi calls them. They were still very much in control. And then I argue how, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, also a BJP leader, in fact, incorporated them. And I draw attention to a very interesting column by Swapan Das Gupta in India today at that time, where he told Vajpayee, you know, you must get your own elite. Why are you, you know, incorporating these IIC members and, you know, all these uh, Luthians, Walas, and, you know, you must get your own elite. And that is precisely what Modi has done, which is to actually push uh, this uh, earlier power elite out in cultural terms. I mean, the, the, the the culturally dominant class, uh, not mm. necessarily the economically dominant class. And, and that's what we are seeing. I mean, Nehru Memorial Museum, I mentioned the whole takeover of Nehru Memorial Museum. It's a classic example 
of, of an institution uh, that, that was global in many ways. The rest of the world came to in Delhi to go to the Nehru Memorial Museum. And today the BJP has made it virtually in an extension of, of the party. Right. In fact, Nilima, that's an interesting um, segue in a sense because, like I said, what I found the most fascinating was this focus on cultural shifts that have taken place because it's fascinating to me how people respond uh, to cultural impetus when they're trying to analyze the world around them. Um, but th there is also a sense that there is an anti-intellectual uh, kind of uh, embodiment of this elite. And I say that when, you know, when we talk about uh, the history of science, I don't even want to, I, I, I'm not going to say more than that. I think you know what I mean. But, you know, the, the sort of anti-science, and anti we, we saw, in fact, even now in the midst of COVID, uh, while there are definitely virtues of, uh, you know, natural medicines and immunity boosters and things like that, when you have a medical doctor as the health minister uh, endorse an Ayurvedic product as a cure for COVID, uh, I think you're seeing uh, the sort of collapse of, of uh, any space between science, culture, uh, identity, uh, Atma Nirbharta and nationalism. I mean, it's all kind of happening in the same space. Uh, I just wanted to... Um maybe, you know, make a historical kind of uh, point here, looking back a little bit on how elites work and maybe that can probably uh, put this into some kind of a paradigm. <laughs> elites themselves don't kind of, it's not possible for the elite to represent everyone. I mean, that's the nature of, of the elite. Yeah. It is not a general uh, uh, construct. It's a very exclusive construct. The idea is that to mainstream it, it is mainstream so the elite therefore represent, the, look as if they represent the entirety. But as Dr. Baru was saying, the regional rise, as you were also observing, the regional rise of various other identities shows how exclusivist elites were. Because mm -hmm. only then this could be balanced, right? So whether it's one identity or the other, the elite have always thrived in a narrow space and by generalizing it, by normalizing it. That is also true for this particular power elite, which wants to create a cultural island and most representative in the central Vistra today. Right. That, that happens to be that small, narrow island, cultural island, which this power elite since, since 2014 wants to mainstream. Now, I again, with like any other elite, the part which has to be remembered is this is exclusivist. It is not wide ranging. I mean, after all, we remember the uh, in the last two months, the amount of misgovernance which has happened has made a lot of people leave that island and actually recognize that it is an island. Hmm. Because th that's what I was saying, that there has to be a synthesis of all these differences when you are talking about a, a, a growth agenda, right? Or an agenda of uh, a proper governance. It cannot be just a cultural islandic idea of elitism, whether it is Hindi speaking, whether it is upper caste, lower caste, whatever it is. Because then it is leaving out a large section and forcing, in fact, the rest to accept that island as the main republic, which is not going to happen. Right. I mean, just, just to also take uh, the, the classification of the elite point forward yeah. a little bit. Um, leave aside that the three of us have some kind of persona of a provincial elite in, in this, uh, in this uh, panel and from the same part of the country as well. Uh, but I want to just ask you, uh, Sanjay Baru, the linkages between the provincial elite and the globalized elite, because in that in your chapter on the, the secession of the successful that you call it, you talk about the Indians who are going abroad, wanting to go abroad, the kind of remittances that, that they send in and, and the influence that they want to wield from outside uh, in India. Um, even there, there is a seg segregation of the provincial and the globalized, in my view, because the H1B techie who has gone from a small village uh, or town in Andhra Pradesh or Telangana versus the uh, the sort of, you know, Arvind Guptas or Manoj Ladwas who have been Silicon Valley um, sort of upstarts who have been able to influence power. There is a segregation there as well. 
Indeed, indeed. In fact, that's the interesting thing about uh, the nature of the uh, you know, out-migrating Indian. That, uh, first of all, unlike many of the other uh, immigrants into developed countries, uh, most Indians who have gone to developed countries, I'm not talking of those who have gone to the Gulf, etc., but the United States, United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, etc., now Singapore, Dubai, uh, are all people who are highly qualified and are going in search of opportunity. Uh, they are not run, running away from exploitation or discrimination or authoritarianism. The, over the last uh, 30 years, they've all gone in search of opportunity. But the interesting thing about the Indian out-migration is that while you have uh, the H-1B, the middle class, particularly from, as you said, our part of India, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, um, while you do have uh, the techie, uh, who is essentially a middle class Indian, going in search of opportunity. The interesting change which I draw attention to is the out-migration of the elite, of the rich, of the wealthy. You now have 176 private schools in the country charging a, you know, monthly fees running into over a lakh of rupees, so an annual fee of 12 to 15 lakhs, uh, offering in, in, you know, international baccalaureate degree basically to equip these students to go abroad. Yeah. I mean, they're being educated in India to go abroad. And we see a lot of Indian business in the last 10, 15 years, we've seen a lot of Indian business shift base uh, abroad. And, and what has happened in the last one year, it's not yet been properly documented, but uh, based on whatever evidence I have, you see a sudden increase in the Indians leaving India. Uh, you know, when the data is in, we can establish that argument that the wealthy are out migrating. And I think that's a great loss. And since you have been, you know, if you don't mind, I'll take just one more minute. Since you have often been writing on foreign, foreign affairs and foreign policy and indo us relations, I have always been arguing that when the Americans complain that India has a trade surplus vis-a-vis -vis the United States and, you know, President Donald Trump removed GSP and, you know, the, the USDR goes on complaining. Uh, we in India have not attempted to quantify yeah. what has been the contribution of these millions of Indians, highly educated from the best institutions like the IITs, going and powering the American economy. You know, yeah. What has been the contribution of the Indian elite to the rise of America or to the, to the su sustained kind of dominance of you know, technological dominance of the United States globally? Uh, and I think that's a project worth looking at. Right. And in fact, Nilima, to just take that point further, when you're looking at what their contribution might be to their host country, where whatever host country they have chosen to adopt, whether it's United States, UK, Europe, whatever, doesn't matter. The question is about them spending their time investing their wealth outside the country and having a view on issues that are, uh, red, that, that are sort of uh, vexing. Uh, the Indian political space and sort of having an outsider's lens. Now, we've talked about the brain drain from the time I think I was born. Uh, you know, this is this is a sort of, we're seeing this happen and in a never-ending kind of way. The idea of globalization and the globalized elite having linkages, the global citizen being, uh, you know, a citizen of the world. What does that mean for issues that are vexing India today, which is poverty, which is a poor infrastructure, which is a clearly poor health infrastructure that we've seen today, uh, which is uh, a sort of a stranglehold on the institutions of democracy? What about all that? Yeah, no, great question, Maya. And also, what is the impact of the global elite, which has obviously a tremendous impact on those countries? What is the impact of global elite on Indian ruling uh, class or the or the governments now i take the example of farmer protests hmm. that was one event in recent past which had brought together a lot of diaspora a lot of global elite indian origin to support the farmer protests right much more than i mean because i was following this i would think that the the global elite supported the farmer protests over the three farm laws much more than even the indian elite did whether of this nature or that nature there was always this suspicion from the Indian elite that 
uh, the the farmers protest was based in some uh, obsession with fighting with the uh, with the government which was absolutely wrong and misplaced and also was rooted in not researching the farm laws deeply enough all this was done by the global elite very well did they were they successful in actually changing the government's uh, uh, mind what they uh, was was the global elite which is otherwise very powerful and in fact i suspect voted and supported modi in huge numbers did i mean in, in terms of supporting modi not voting i am saying that did they actually uh, were they able to change the mind of a government which they thought was going to make india grand no so even the, the my my point is that over the last 6 7 years we have seen the elite actually condense into an ego now that is the next step for an elite i believe you know a power elite which becomes too narrow too exclusivist then becomes some sort of a almost almost a semi individual ego now that ego is no longer class caste province nothing it is just individualistic now there is no arguing with such egos so that's what is happening so it doesn't matter how powerful the uh, diaspora is the global elites are, how valuable they are to this country it doesn't matter nothing happened nothing changed 200 300 farmers have died on delhi's borders right so sanjay barut i want to ask you one question and then we'll take a couple of questions from the audience which is that in this sort of exclusivity that has been created around this new elite um what is the role of we we've, we've talked about the role of popular media and the creation of cultural uh, ideas or you know the flow of cultural thinking what is the role of the mass media the news media and what do you think has been the role of the social media because the linkages between the provincial and the globalized elite actually are now coming in online so how do you think that is impacting shaping uh the the strangle hold of this elite this small elite with a particular world view on the rest of society well you know as far as the media is concerned um, the status of the media has gone through ups and downs over the last 70 years um during the emergency for example the media was on the defensive uh, the, the state was so powerful and uh, was so aggressive in in alienating the media that we went through a terrible phase of of uh, denial of freedom of uh, press and speech we came out of the emergency and there was a boom a media boom in the 90s and i mentioned that and we came to a point uh, where i quote in fact samir jain in my book uh, when he was asked uh, is the times of india group pro establishment or anti establishment and his reply was we are neither pro establishment nor anti establishment we are the establishment so <laughs> that was an assertion of confidence of the indian media for the for a, a newspaper uh, owner to assert that he is the establishment prime ministers come and go but times of india editor remains you know all powerful uh, and that was true at that time i mean we had seven prime ministers uh, in the period from 1980 uh you know mid 80s to the mid 90s uh coming and going while the times of india every day increased its readership from there we have come to a situation today where the media uh, the mainstream media uh is um, you know virtually um, ghettoized um mm-hmm. unless it is with the government i mean you either have you know vocally pro government media whether it is republic tv or times now or Uh, uh, CNN and IBN, um, or you have the ghettoized, uh, you know, <laughs> the papers I write for, you know, Indian Express. You know, okay, the, the critics of the government can write there, or Hindu, uh, but that's not mainstream anymore. The mainstream is the vernacular. Yeah. The mainstream is the vernacular, and you know that is the shift that the readership of Hindi newspapers has been rising. Readership of Telugu newspapers has been rising. you know so you see a change in the com- in the very um uh, uh, what should i say consumers of news and the pur- purveyors of news on social media i must confess very quickly uh, this is a, a blind spot for me 
uh, I have I use the social media, but uh, when I was in the media, it, it was not a phenomenon. You know, it became a phenomenon after I left the media. Uh, but clearly, um, you know, social media cuts both ways. I mean, yeah. those those who rise uh, thanks to the social media can also sink thanks to the social media. You know, I think that's one thing we should always remember that it doesn't work only one way. It can cut both ways. But I think in terms of connectivity, Nilima, uh, just come in on this because he uh, he talked about the the sort of media shifting more important in influential media now being the regional language, the vernacular media. In fact, and just to take the current context into account, uh, that media seems to today be far more questioning and far more critical uh, than the English speaking uh, mass media like the channels and publications that you mentioned. Uh, we're seeing, in fact, papers like Dainik Haskar or Gujarat Samachar, uh, you know, every day asking questions that no journalist in Delhi uh, has the confidence to ask so boldly. Yeah. And I think that's where the real hope, to be honest, is. Because I think uh, one thing, see, we have to take one step back. Why is the regional media so um, courageous, to put it like this, right? Why is it actually be doing journalism? Right, the way we want journalists to do journalism. One of the one of the main reasons has been digital media. Uh, the reason why, at least the regional media has to match up, is because everybody who has a who has uh, access to social media, who has a who has a phone with a camera, can record news, and they now demand better news from regional channels. Now the larger central or the mainstream channels don't have to listen to these small people, you know, uh, people with uh, a real desire for their, their news, but the regional channels have to. Now, then we come to what we see today as an actually chronology, as a development of that, that when citizen journalists or non-journalists, but citizen uh, uh, observers notice that the regional media is not matching up to their information, how it is being covered, the truth, the fake news, the entire package, they demand better news and are able to get it from a regional uh, uh, you know, media, which is less on the pedestal than the mainstream media, which mm. can get away with right? talking about Shushan Singh Rajput through half of the time of the first, uh, 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 first yeah. wave okay? yeah. and half of the time of the second wave until the regional media actually picked up these stories from backwaters of uh, Ganges and other places and brought us these images and that's when the mainstream media had to sit up and say look okay they are bringing these stories we can't be seen as uh, ignoring them so mm -hmm. that's where i think the chronology uh, you know how it works but having said this will this stay that's the real question now yeah. between the second and first and second wave of covid how many mainstream media channels actually ran stories on health policy how many uh, how many mainstream anchors did stories on preparedness of hospitals. So I I still believe that that level of elitist exclusivity operates in the, in the mainstream national media in some parts, of course. And the real challenge for it is coming from the digital and the regional uh, media. So let's see if they can remain true. Yeah, and I think to kind of wrap up that comment as well is that, you know, if public health becomes an issue of elite concern, Yes. then perhaps uh, we will see more of it on the mainstream media. But it wasn't up until the last month when people in Delhi, decide, you know, were finding themselves at the receiving end of the cracks in the public health infrastructure. That's a, that's a, that's a great example, actually. Um, uh, Sanjay Baru, Pradeep Mehta has a question for you. Uh, do you agree that if the elite worked on an old boys network in the past, the new elite works on the links with the RSS irrespective of the state that person belongs to. So this again kind of puts into question regional forces, uh, provincial elites, national elites. What's your take? Well, yes, I mean, I think now you have to belong not to St. Stephen's or Doom School, but uh, to the RSS uh, to be a part of the uh, new power elite in this country. That is true. Um, and that that is the kind of transformation that we are beginning to see. I mean, for example, in a university like the Jawaharlal Nehru University, the vice chancellor was put there, has been recruiting people with the avowedly kind of RSS or BJP background. 
uh, converting the composition, the, the academic composition of one of uh, India's leading universities. And we will, we will see much more of that happening uh, in other institutions as well. So that is the cultural revolution I'm talking about. Now, in fact, in my second chapter where I talk about you know, what have happened in China, the reason why I use the term cultural revolution and draw parallel to what happened in China, it's because in China, during the cultural revolution, the party hardcore ideologues took over the state, ejected the intellectual class out. Professors from Beijing University, Peking University, were sent to villages to, you know, to cultivate uh, farms. And, and, and you know, that anti-intellectualism, which we associated with the Chinese Cultural Revolution, we see that happening today. So it doesn't matter what your qualifications are, as long as you mouth the correct uh, kind of slogans, uh, you are in. Right. So I just want to, you know, we have only about five minutes left, but I, so I want to ask you to take this point forward then. Is the, uh, if the elite is about links to the RSS and links to the BJP's ideology, religious ideology, political ideology, etc., cetera, um, the push towards, you know, what you say in the book and you're quoting as well uh, when you mention it is from India to Bharat. I mean, really, where are we on that spectrum today? Uh, according to you. Um, and that question is not so much just a cultural question, but also a political question. So, uh, you know, where do you see us today? And well, where do we go from here? I think that that is a larger phenomenon. I mean, I don't want to say that this movement from India to Bharat is actually a movement from non-BJP to BJP. That's a wrong argument. Hmm. To identify BJP and the RSS as Bharat as yeah. opposed to, you know, everybody else in India. I think that's a completely false uh, analogy. That is their but, assertion. Exactly. That's their yeah. assertion. The, the, what is, the way I understand this transition is really the emergence of middle castes and vernacular Indians. I mean, I, I mentioned somewhere in the book, you know, that uh, I, you know, I belong to a generation where when you went to a restaurant, somebody uh, did not know the difference between a fork and a spoon and felt very shy about it. And today you have a, a people who wouldn't give a damn. I mean, they just eat with their hand, right? Now that is a larger change in India. It's nothing to do with the BJP. You see across the country, a new aspirational India. And I think Narendra Modi was right to identify them as a, you know, a, a target group for his politics. And I conclude, in fact, my book by arguing, uh, has he succeeded in fulfilling their aspirations? Because if there is an aspirational India that voted for Modi, and I think they did in 2014 and 2019, that aspirational India wants what? Jobs, yeah. not temples. They want employment. They want better healthcare. They want better education. They want better urban facilities. They want better infrastructure. And unless the current government delivers on that, you will not be able to fulfill the aspirations of Bharat because it is this new, uh, you know, uh, new India, if you like, the, the new generation of Indians who are moving out of small towns, moving out of, you know, rural uh, background and yeah. coming to big cities. Uh, but they have the same aspirations as the Luthians Delhi Wallas or uh, South Bombay people, which hmm. is to have a better life. That is the aspiration of, a, of anyone, right? For a better yeah. quality of life. But, but Nilima, very quickly, um, just to get from you this idea of the aspirational Indian. I mean, mo politicians time and time again have appealed to a certain vote bank. This is, uh, this is uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's chosen vote bank or was the chosen vote bank. In the absence of the job creation, in the absence of the wealth creation, the fallback tool has been identity and cultural appropriation, right? So the question of whether they will continue in spite of the economic situation we find ourselves in, because as Dr. Baru said earlier, is that, you know, uh, the BJP's or Narendra Modi's personal politics is about, you know, the left's radicalism, Hindutva ideology and Lohiaite welfareism, the, the sort of co the coalescing of all three is not working out the way he might have anticipated. So where do we go from here? Yeah, no, why is it not working? Because I think the uh, the way forward is always a synthesis of memory of a nation, 
and its aspiration memory and aspiration of a nation it has to be brought together for the way forward that's why it's not working out the second thing is that we have we we on any of the indicators just one indicator 67000 farmer suicides since 2014 till date now again no change in these kind of disastrous data the the way to handle it is not to manage the data what we have seen during the covid situation the right. the aspiration for which mr modi was elected has been replaced by ambition of mr modi and that has to change that has to change that's where i would like to say right okay i think we're uh, completely out of time but uh, sanjay varu kota nilima thank you very much for this discussion i didn't actually hold up my copy of the book first because it was all full of the post states but i see all those yeah i will now for everyone just to let you know you know you should read it the power elite class caste and a cultural revolution i uh, sort of conclude by saying my interest was always on the cultural aspects because i think that's what i sort of pick up on the most um, and i think uh, you know it there's a lot of food for thought because you wrote this book and in your introduction you say it that you wrote it during the lockdown last year uh, and we don't know if you would have written it differently after the second wave but i think that's for your next book sanjay varu thanks so much uh, for for joining us and i'm going to hand back to the wonderful team at jlf thank you maya thank you very thank much you. Thank you so much, Maya Mitchandani, Sanjay Baru, Kota Nilima. That was absolutely brilliant as usual. The way forward, as Kota said, the way forward is the synthesis of memory and aspiration. And of course, in Sanjay Baru's book, we are looking at the new India who demands a change. I thank you all for being such a great audience. And uh, as you all know, the grave repercussions of COVID-19 has set us back in many ways, and the arts community has been hugely impacted. we started i believe art matters in 2020 and we've been able to help about 5200 families uh, involved in the arts and now we need to start helping them again we need to feed them we need to provide all sorts of health and uh, food support so do if possible uh, press on the donate button that you can see on the screen and donate as much as you can this will really help uh, these families across the length and breadth of india Meanwhile we look forward to seeing you next at 8:30 p.m. IST for our session fiction as resistance to the unmaking of india nantara sagal in conversation with jenti naju said till then stay safe and stay double masked times uh, during covid when we're all sitting at home it's it's sort of like a ray of light that we get to watch these amazing sessions when we can't all be together it certainly brightens up my evenings aaj pandemic mein hum digitally jaipur literature festival kar rahe hain aur mujhe lagta hai ki hamare samne shrota nahi hai hum aapas mein baat kar rahe hain lekin us feel ko us mang ko mehsoos kar sakte hain ki hazaron lakhon log humse jude hue hain humko sun rahe hain aur kahin na kahin koi ek sarthak sat sat chhe ho raha hai people who came online to view and listen to our incredible speakers from across the world we were able to continue in our tradition of ensuring the free flow of knowledge and information